Okay, we're going to switch gears from new caps to volcanoes. Uh, we have the volcano expert here. Uh, Dr. Michael Pavlonis has over 11 years working as a physical scientist with NOAA for the national, basically for NESDES. Mike specializes in developing near real-time applications for present day and future satellites with a focus on volcanic clouds, short-term severe weather forecasting, meteorological and cloud properties relevant to aviation and ground transportation. In 2015, Mike was the recipient of the 2015 NOAA David Johnson Award and the 2015 American Aeronautical Society Earth Science and Applications Award. So welcome, Michael. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, shifting gears a bit, but I think this is an interesting topic. We've all flown on airplanes, and we all want to be safe on airplanes. And so I want to sort of talk about how JPSS measurements play a role in keeping aviation safe in the wake of a volcanic eruption. And there'll be some sort of hands-on or inter interactive exercises uh, throughout this where we'll put you in the uh, role of a decision maker. So. Uh, bring your A-game, because the uh, consequences of being wrong are, are, are quite severe. So um, it, it would, it's not mandatory, but it would be helpful uh, if you had the presentation on your computer. If you don't, we'll make it work. Don't worry. Okay. So first up, volcanic clouds in aviation. Why is this even a relevant problem? Well, first I have to define what I mean by volcanic clouds. So volcanic clouds are uh, a complicated things. No two are alike. Um, and, and they generally con, uh, contain uh, several different constituents. Uh, but, but sort of the baseline definition is though a cloud that contains volcanic ash and or sulfur dioxide or SO2 that's produced uh, by volcanic emissions. Uh, so that's, that's the core definition, but these things are complicated. So some will contain mainly ash and very little sulfur dioxide. Some will contain sulfur dioxide and little to no ash. And then, especially after a, an explosive eruption, um, you'll get very complicated clouds. You'll get what we often call as dirty, uh, dirty thunderstorms. So you get these clouds that contain volcanic ash, sulfur dioxide, and also a lot of hydrometeors, uh, mainly in the form of ice. And they, 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 they look like cumulonimbus clouds, like this picture I'm showing here in the middle on the right. So these are very complicated things. There is no one single instrument uh, that's ideally suited to detecting and characterizing all types of volcanic clouds. So we really do need a multi-sensor approach, and the JPSS platform is really ideal for that. Uh, so why are volcanic clouds an hazard, ha a hazard to aviation? Well, there's several reasons. One, volcanic ash is very, very abrasive. Um, and so when an, an aircraft flies through it, it, it basically gets sandblasted. So your windscreens will become um, completely opaque. Uh, the airframes get damaged and other flight surfaces as well. It wreaks havoc with the uh, pedostatic system, which is very important for knowing what your airspeed is. If you don't know what your airspeed is and you, you make the wrong adjustments as a pilot, there are catastrophic consequences to that. Um, also, it, it gets ingested into um, air conditioning, cooling systems, the electrical and avionic unit, units, fuel and hydraulic systems. I mean, oftentimes it'll set off the smoke detectors in, in, in planes and and so when there have been encounters, uh, you know, the crew will be frantically looking for a fire that doesn't exist. Um, and then the most uh, critical thing, uh, or the thing you worry about the most in flight anyway, is the damage to the jet engines and can actually lead to in-flight engine failure and has. Um, the first time th this happened uh, on a commercial, with a commercial plane at least, was in 1982 at a British Airways flight flying from um, Indonesia to Perth, Australia, on June 24th. And um, it flew into a, a volcanic ash cloud from an eruption of a volcano called Galungung. And um, when they were cruising at about 37,000 feet, they um, lost power to all four engines. And so this is a 747. This is a very big plane. And so it was a very, very big glider at that point. Um, and uh, at, at 37,000 feet, the problem began, and so they were able to control the descent of the plane down to about 12,000 feet, where they got out of the ash cloud, um, and they were actually able to um, restart three of the engines at that point at about 12,000 feet, and they were actually able to make an emergency landing in, in Jakarta. 
Um, so the, the issue, when you get ash into a jet engine, jet engines are very hot. So the ash melts inside the combustion chamber. And then it goes into the turbine and it cools and it deposits on the turbine veins. And if you get enough of that, uh, if, uh, if enough of it deposits, you'll uh, restrict the flow of high pressure gases and the engine will flame out. Um, what they were very fortunate, the very fortunate thing is, is that while they were gliding uh, and gliding out of the cloud, there were enough vibrations in the engine um, and it had cooled down because it was shut down and then the ash is brittle enough that enough of it fell off that they were able to get the flow of the high pressure gases going again. Um, at one point while this was happening, Captain Eric Moody, who's a legend in, in, in aviation and his crew, that they, they did a a tremendous job. He came on the loudspeaker when they were gliding down and everyone on the plane knew something terrible was wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. Then he continued, um, we're doing our damnedest to get them going. I trust you're not in too much distress. Um, this, this sort of in-flight engine failure happened again in 1989, this time outside of Anchorage, Alaska with a KLM flight. Um, they, there was an eruption of Mount Redoubt, which is not far from Anchorage and has erupted since then. And on approach to Anchorage at about 25,000 feet, they flew into a very, very dark cloud, what they described as a very dark cloud. Um, they knew that was a bad thing, and so the pilot's reaction was to climb to try to get out of it. Well, if you're going to climb, you have to uh, increase the thrust and, and the power of the engine which turns out to be, we now know, one of the worst things that you can do um, because you'll ingest more ash, the engine will be hotter, the problem will be exacerbated. And as they were climbing to 27,000 feet, they lost power at all four engines. And, and this was over mountainous terrain, so there's not a lot of time to recover from this one. Um, fortunately, at about 17,000 feet, they got two of the engines restarted as they got out of the ash cloud. Um, and then at 12,000 feet, they got another two engines started and they made it into Anchorage, uh, heavily damaged. Uh, I saw the windscreen from this plane. It's on display, Eric has seen it as well, at, at Merrill Field in, in, in Anchorage. Um, and uh, it's, it's completely opaque. So you've, you know, you're know, you a pilot, you've just had this experience, you gotta make this harrowing landing and you can't see anything out your windscreen. So it's, it's really, uh, quite the hazard. The economic impacts are also severe. So you may remember this uh, eruption in Iceland from the Eyjafjall the Jökull volcano in 2010, uh, where aviation in Europe was basically shut down. Uh, it, it mounted about 50% of the world's air traffic being impacted. You know, the losses were in the billions uh, on this, and there were airlines that nearly went bankrupt over this. So even uh, beyond the, the hazard aspect, the economic impacts are really severe. So knowing exactly where ash is um, is very, very critical. You don't want to shut down more airspace than you have to. Uh, of course, there are about 1,500 volcanoes in the world. That's those red dots. And uh, major flight routes are in blue. And uh, flight routes and, and, and given the you know, global nature of aviation and, and volcanoes frequently intersect. Even volcanoes that are in the middle of nowhere will have an impact on aviation eventually because the winds will disperse the cloud far away from the source volcano. Um, every year there's about 10 or so volcanoes um, that will have explosive eruptions that reach jet cruising altitudes in about five minutes or less. Um, and there's over 60 volcanoes every year at any given time that are in a state of eruption. So this is a fairly common problem even though it doesn't make the news all the time. It is kind of an ev every day something is, a, a volcano is erupting, producing an ash cloud somewhere, usually more than one volcano. Um, in re so so in, in the early 1990s, in response to this challenge, the United Nations, uh, and more specifically the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is part of the United Nations, set up nine volcanic ash advisory centers around the world that are staffed 24-7, 365, uh, to monitor globally for volcanic ash and issue volcanic ash advisories to aviation. Um, NOAA actually operates two of those volcanic ash advisory centers, one stationed in Anchorage with an area of responsibility you see here, uh, and another one that's stationed in College Park, Maryland, uh, that has a very large area of responsibility that goes well beyond the bounds of the United States. So uh, this is a problem from an operational aspect that NOAA certainly cares about. 
Um, satellites really are the key to keeping aviation safe and detecting it. Um, in situ observations like this is not the best way to go. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, this is one of those scenarios where satellite really is the main player. It's not a supplement. It is really the main player. It's not the only one, but it is the main. Okay, so how does JPSS help in this endeavor? So there, there are, as, as Mitch talked about this morning and others have, have talked about, there, there are several instruments on the JPSS platforms. Um, and uh, there are three instruments in particular that I'm going to talk about that are most relevant to volcanic cloud monitoring. And the first one of those is VIRS, or the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. We saw a lot of VIRS imagery already. We know how stunning it is. Um, and we've also seen many true color images. So true color images, you try to image things the way the human eye sees them. It's not exactly the case, but, but it's pretty close. And so uh, volcanic ash absorbs light. It's very effective at absorbing light. Whereas like meteorological clouds, they scatter light. That's why they appear, generally appear bright white. Uh, but volcanic clouds, with, if there's a large ash content, is, are very absorbing and they appear very dark, just like they do to the human eye. So there's, this is a, a Sing Yang Ape in 2014 in Indonesia, true color compared to true life. You, you get, you know, they're, they're, they're roughly the same. So this is a nice tool for uh, when there's enough ash present. Uh, for thin ash clouds, this doesn't work so well. Um, of course, that, you can only do that true color imagery during the day, but at night, uh, VIRS has a day-night band, so a low light sensor, uh, and uh, it, it, it allows you to see um, uh, very interesting things in the wake of an explosive volcanic eruption in particular. This is the uh, Kalut cloud, which was an eruption that happened in Indonesia in 2015. The cloud made it to about uh, 20, 25 kilometers, uh, so punched through the very high tropopause in Indonesia. It uh, had these incredible gravity waves coming off it that the day-night band saw very, very nicely. But the, the bread and butter for operational uh, volcanic ash detection is in the infrared because you could use it day and night and it, it's useful for tracking the cloud as it disperses in time. Uh, whereas the, the visible wavelengths are, are primarily useful for the near source part when you have a very thick cloud. Uh, as it disperses the visible, the, the cloud is harder to track. So in the infrared, uh, the reason we, we were able to use the infrared is there's, there's something uh, called differential absorption. So typically for weather clouds, as wavelength increases from about 10 microns to about 12 microns, um, the measured brightness temperature that you get will decrease with increasing wavelength. Okay, that's because the, the transmission of energy through that cloud decreases as a function of increasing wavelengths. So you're getting less radiation from the warmer ground and lower atmosphere, and most of your energy is coming from, from the higher, colder atmosphere. But for volcanic ash, that signature is opposite, generally. There are exceptions where wavelength increases, um, the, the measured infrared brightness temperature will uh, actually increase. So. VIRS has two bands that capture this, the M15 and the M16 band. So the, the M15 is around 10.8 uh, microns, the M16 is around 12 microns. Uh, so if you look at the difference in brightness temperature between these two bands, um, it's a really useful way to distinguish volcanic ash from other types of clouds. So just, I'll look at an example to show, show how this works. So we'll zoom in on the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia, which has several active volcanoes, including one that's erupting right now. Um, volcanic ash from the Kamchatka volcanoes typically will get picked up by the westerly winds and end up being a problem for Alaska uh, many times a year. So, Okay, so what, one way of looking at this is to take the brightness temperature difference between 11 and 12 microns as measured by VIRS and image that in a way that, that accentuates um, the difference between negative values and positive values. So negative values will be associated with volcanic ash for the reasons I just said on the previous slide. Um, and positive values will generally be uh, associated with other features, other cloud types, and the surface. So um, the negative values in this color scheme are sort of the dark grays into the blues and these other, other non-grayscale colors. And so here you can see uh, there's a pretty good volcanic ash signature here associated with an eruption of the Shivaluch volcano on Kamchatka Peninsula. Ice clouds or mid or high level uh, clouds uh, will tend to have a very positive 
values of this brightness temperature difference, which appear white in this image. Stratus clouds will have values that are kind of close to zero. Um, so they can overlap a bit with what you see for volcanic ash. That's a problem we have to deal with. Um, but in general, uh, in the, a well-behaved situation, volcanic ash stands out quite nicely. It's not always well-behaved. Unfortunately, there are challenges here. And one way to overcome those challenges is to move on from split window imagery, just a brightness temperature difference image, to something called a false color image, which um, have been shown by other speakers today. So a uh, false color image is where you use the red, green, and color guns, and you, you put different uh, measurements on each of those color guns. So the one that is really relevant to volcanic cloud remote sensing is where you put the 12 minus 11 micron brightness temperature difference on the red gun. So positive values of that will are associated with volcanic ash because I reversed the, the differencing. Um, and that will produce, um, that will result in a reddening of the image. On the green color gun, you put the 11 minus 8.5 micron brightness temperature difference. Um, we put that one on there as mainly a sensi sensitivity to sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide absorbs radiation at 8.5 microns, but does not at 11 microns. So when you take that brightness temperature difference, if sulfur dioxide is present, it will tend to have larger positive values uh, and cause a, a, a greening of the image. And then we have the 11 micron brightness temperature on the blue band. So volcanic ash, um, uh, where the volcanic ash signature is very strong, will appear red. Where you have both volcanic ash and sulfur dioxide, where it will appear yellow. Um, ice clouds will appear, you know, I mean, they could range from, from black to brown to sort of greenish. Stratus clouds will be this sort of milky yellow. Um, and so when you're looking at this image and looking for volcanic clouds, so if you look, Volcanic ash signature is associated with red. If you have volcanic ash and SO2, it's sort of a yellowish. If you have sulfur dioxide with no ash, it'll appear green. Um, just another example to highlight that's a little more interesting. So this is the Kamchatka Peninsula again. And so here we have a lot more high-level ice clouds, which appear brown here. And then inside this brown polygon here, you'll see the reds. So amongst the meteorological cloud cover here, you have volcanic ash. And what's really interesting here is there's a jet contrail, probably uh, flying in the wrong place there. Because, uh, uh, but it does show you that um, these things aren't always picked up on, and sometimes the hazard's out there and you don't know it, and uh, you'll fly through it. OK, so the first exercise, building on what we know about veers. So we're gonna, it's a scenario in which we're going to look at a volcanic ash emission near uh, Mexico City Airport. So the Popocatapetl volcano is about 50 miles southeast of uh, Mexico City Airport, a very busy airport. Um, you can just see here from the flight routes, a lot of flights coming from all directions. So any ash emission, even if it's a small one from Popocatzapetl, is, is significant. So the question I pose is, utilizing the Veer's false color image on the next slide, identify the volcanic cloud produced by a Popocatzapetl uh, explosion uh, and, uh, and then sort of explain uh, what you think the primary composition of that cloud is. Is it volcanic ash or SO2 or both? So moving this out of the way, uh, where is the, the volcanic emission from Popocatzapetl in that image? So am I, uh, am I, is it? Am I getting hot or cold as I do this? Oh, all right. So we've, you've all nailed it. Yes, this is the ash emission from Popocatzapetl. So if you're working in a volcanic ash advisory center, this would exactly be your job. Routine monitoring satellite imagery, finding the hazard, putting a box around it, and sending the coordinates of that box out to aviation so nobody flies there. You also have to get the height of the cloud, uh, but that's another part of the problem. And I just want, as a bit of a prologue to this case, so we all know that the, GOES, the GOES-R capabilities are fantastic compared to the, the Heritage GOES. And um, that being said, um, this is the corresponding GOES-16 ABI image for this case. VIRS compared to ABI. Um, now that we know where the cloud is, we can pick it out in ABI. But if we didn't have that VIRS image, and all we had was this one red pixel here, that's not always enough to go on. Um, so e even though uh, 
you know, we get such frequent images from GOES, the low Earth orbiters play a, a key role in this problem. The next instrument uh, that is particularly useful is the Crosstrack Infrared Sounder, or CRIS. You heard a lot about it from, from Nadia, and, uh, and so that's going to be very helpful in, in my endeavor to explain it because she did a, did a very, very nice job uh, talking about infrared spectra. So the, the concept I, I talked about before with the infrared where the, the relationship between the brightness temperature and wavelength in the 10 to 12 micron range, that still holds for high spectral resolution measurements. Uh, but it's more robust. So with VIRS, we have two measurements to capture that relationship. With CRIS, we have hundreds. And, and having those hundreds um, allows you to see new, allows you to uh, sort of effectively raise the signal to noise. Um, you lose spatial resolution because Chris footprints are much larger than Veer's, uh, but you do gain uh, spectral integrity. And so for volcanic ash detection, where again, we focus on this 10 to 12 micron part of the spectrum where we're looking at this difference in, 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 in transmission between meteorological clouds and, and volcanic ash clouds where the, uh, uh, there, there's an opposite relationship. So when, when volcanic ash is present, the, the crisp brightness temperature will generally increase with increasing wavelength between 10 and 12 microns. And I'll show you here. So let's go back to our Veers image of this uh, Kamchatka case. And let's look at two crisp spectra uh, in the 10 to 12 micron range uh, for two different uh, parts of this image. So first, looking at within in the volcanic ash cloud here, so we have a wavelength on the x-axis increasing from right to left, uh, and then wave number increasing from left to right. Wave number is sort of the standard uh, unit that, that is used with high spectral measure, resolution measurements. And then we have brightness temperature from Chris uh, on the y-axis. And so what you see for the uh, ash cloud, the brightness temperature increases with increasing wavelength, uh, whereas for the uh, meteorological cloud here, this is like some mid or high level meteorological cloud, probably composed of ice. The uh, brightness temperature measured by Chris increase or decreases with increasing wavelength. So opposite slopes. Okay, so when you, you make an image with, with uh, wavelength increasing from left to right and brightness temperature on the y axis, then if you have a negative slope, that's often associated with volcanic ash. If you have a positive slope, then you're looking at meteorological clouds. Um, but Chris is not only sensitive to volcanic ash. It's also sensitive to trace gases, including sulfur dioxide. And the reason for that is in the 7.3 micron uh, uh, region of the spectrum, there's a very strong sulfur dioxide absorption signature indicated by green here. So the higher green values indicate stronger absorption by sulfur dioxide. And Chris measures in this part of the spectrum. Um, and so what you can do is you can find a, a Chris channel where the sulfur dioxide absorption is very strong. And then you can find another Chris channel outside where there is no sulfur dioxide absorption, but where the absorption by other features such as water vapor, because this is a, a region where water vapor absorbs very strongly as well, is about equal to what the, the, the water vapor absorption is where you do have SO2 absorption. So you're effectively only looking at a, sen your, your primary sensitivity is driven by the sulfur dioxide and nothing else. And you could take the difference between those two brightness temperatures. So for Chris, a good combination is to look at um, the brightness temperature at about 1407 and a half inverse centimeters minus the brightness temperature at 1371.25 inverse centimeters. And, um, and then you can image that. So when you have values of this brightness temperature difference that are about four or greater, um, that's indicative of a of, of robust SO2 signature that is above background levels. Um, and you can see for this Kamchatka case, we do have um, where the cloud is actually located. As we know from the previous viewers' images, we do get some of those robust signals. Now, there is one caveat about Chris 
and the ability to, to remotely sense sulfur dioxide is that because this is happening within a strong water vapor absorption band, most of the energy is coming from the middle to upper uh, troposphere. Uh, very little of the en measured e uh, energy is coming from the lower troposphere. So sulfur dioxide clouds from volcanic processes that are in the lower atmosphere are, are generally not going to be picked up by Chris unless the atmosphere is very, very dry. Uh, so Chris is very, very good at, 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 mid, at, at SO2 that's in the mid troposphere or higher, um, lower tropospheric, uh, less sensitive, or very little sensitivity. Let's just compare how, because again, we're taking a multi-instrument approach here. So here's that Veers image again, and then here's the Chris SO2 image. So you can see how the higher values of the, that SO2 brightness temperature difference uh, align with what we can see in the Veers image. Okay, so the second uh, sort of interactive part here, we're going to look at the Calbuco eruption that occurred. Uh, there were two big explosions that occurred. One occurred late in the day on April 22nd, and the other one early on the day, April 23rd of 2015. This was a very photogenic eruption um, because there was a town nearby, so a lot of people saw it. Fortunately, there, there, there were no hazards to the town other than the ash fall. Um, but you can see here just spectacular volcanic lightning, um, this beautiful uh, cumulonimbus type cloud. And so what we're going to look at, and this, this occurred in Chile, so that we're down here. This is where Calbuco is located. This is just zoomed in on, on the area. Um, and so after those two big explosions, the atmospheric winds uh, basically took the, the, the volcanic cloud uh, up to the northeast. So the flow was kind of the northeast, and then it hit strong westerlies and headed east. And so what we're going to look at here is we're going to look at as the cloud is, was dispersed by the wind after the big eruption, and we're going to try to find out where is the, um, the bounds of the hazard? Because that's when you have the big cloud that's dispersing, accurately identifying the bounds of that cloud is critical. You don't want to make them too big because then you're re unnecessarily restricting airspace. Economic impacts are significant. You don't want to miss ash because we know it's a major hazard. So this is a difficult job for volcanic ash advisory centers. So with that in mind, uh, utilize the, the Veers false color image that I'll show on the next slide as well, and, and the crisp brightness temperature spectra uh, shown on the slide after that, and the crisp sulfur dioxide brightness temperature difference image shown on the slide after that to answer the following questions. So I have three lines on this uh, false color image here. Which of those lines, the white, the black, or the gray, uh, most accurately describe the northern extent of the Calbuco cloud and why? Um, and then the second one is, uh, this is a scenario that actually does happen sometimes. A risk-taking airline decides to fly where the where volcanic cloud is identifiable, and identifiable in JPSS products, but they subsequently report a strong smell that's kind of like rotten eggs. Which part of the cloud did they likely fly through? The part marked by A or the par part marked by B? Okay, so here's the false color image. I'll give you, I'll leave that up there for a couple of seconds here so you could digest that. And I'll flip back. Okay, so the false color image is still up. You can still see that. Now you have Chris spectra and they're numbered where, wh what locations it came from. So uh, number one was, is this spectra, number two is this one, number three is here, and there's number four. So remember what I said about the relationship between wavelength and uh, brightness temperature, what relate you're looking for, you know, positive versus negative slopes. And then the final piece of information here is the sulfur dioxide brightness temperature difference. Um, so let's for now focus on, I'll leave this one up since it has the false color image. So focusing on answering the first question, which of those three lines best represent the northern bounds, there's this is, this is enough information to answer that question, having the Chris spectra and the Veer's false color image. So what, um, does anybody want to answer that? So we have, the, we have it on the, uh, right. on the polling. So if though I know there's a few of you in here that are using the Slido. Um, it's a pretty simple question, which line, white, black, or gray? And uh, 
I believe it's active. Nobody's responded to it yet, but we'll give you a chance. Oh, there we go. We've got two. Yeah, I, I mean, just don't mess it up. That's <coughs> the, that's the, this is. Okay, I think we have an answer, Mike. All right. 86% uh, of the class said black. 86% would be right. Um, so, <laughs> well done. This is a hard one because, I mean, but this is how things normally evolve. It's complicated. So the Veers image is useful, but it has some limitations because there's this thick meteorological cloud here. So you don't know exactly where the ash cuts off in the Veers image alone. It gives you an idea, but it, it really is the crisp spectra here where you get the, the negative slope in uh, locations one and locations four, um, but you don't get it in locations two and three. That, that really gives you the answer. So the second part of that question, and maybe I'll put this one up. So if, if the uh, pilot of a rogue airline was smelled rotten eggs, where were they likely at, point A or point B? And we've got three participants so far, four. Well, they can't see the majority until you vote. So, um, all right. It sounds like we have 89% saying A. That is right. So what you can see here, th th this is the most, I mean, this brightness temperature difference from, um, from Chris is really convincing. Down here, it's very low, well below the threshold of four, where you, you have robust SO2 signature. Here in A, it's very, very high, well above that. But you also get clues in the Veers image. So A has this yellow color, which is indicative of both um, uh, absorption effects from volcanic ash and sulfur dioxide, whereas in B, it's just this light color of red, which uh, implies that there's, there's, there's not much sulfur dioxide there. Okay, uh, one prologue to this uh, I want to bring up I, I, is, is the value of the I bands and the spatial resolution on VIRS. So this is the Calbuco cloud after the uh, second of the two big explosions. So this is the big umbrella cloud. Um, and in the I band imagery, so just like with thunderstorms, you get these overshoots. And these overshooting cores can, you know, the spatial extent of them is, is fairly small, but they're very important for understanding how the, the, the cloud is going to evolve into the future. And in VIRS I-band imagery, uh, we get a minimum brightness temperature in this overshooting region of minus 101 degrees Celsius. That's pretty, you don't see that with weather. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at the corresponding GOES imagery, and granted this was before GOES R, so things are better now, but this was four kilometer resolution GOES, in that overshooting region, the, the minimum brightness temperature is only minus 66. So if you try to transfer that uh, temperature information to height, that makes a big difference. The cloud really got up to about 18 kilometers, but you would have thought it was 12 if you were just looking at goes. Okay, so the final instrument I'm going to talk about is OMPS, or the Ozone Mapping Suite, or Profiler Suite. So OMPS measures in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, so it does rely on energy from the sun to provide meaningful measurements, so it's a daytime only capability. It's primarily used uh, historically, the UV measurements for uh, measuring ozone. Um, ozone, of course, is critical. We want to know are there holes in the ozone layer and things like that, um, also for, for air quality purposes. Um, but in the UV, you also have SO2 absorption features, and you have some very strong ones, and you have some not so strong ones. So when you combine measurements in the UV uh, where you do have strong SO2 absorption with places where you don't, uh, that gives you enough sensitivity to not only detect SO2, but to uh, estimate how much SO2 is present in a given column. And so the, the standard way of looking at OMPS for SO2 information, and OMPS has a bigger footprint, that's why you'll, this, is, this looks blocky, uh, is to look at the total column loading in Dobson units. So Dobson units is something that's used for ozone as well. 
It's the thickness that a gas would have, or a one Dobson unit is equivalent to 0.01 millimeters of a given gas at standard pressure and temperature. Um, but uh, so that's the historical reason for having Dobson units. But um, we, we also use them for SO2. And whenever you get above about uh, a half a Dobson unit, that's a pretty good indicator that the SO2 is present beyond uh, background levels from ops. And so you can see for our Camp Chaka event here, you do have a lot of regions where the value exceeds about a half of a Dobson unit. Um, unlike Chris, OMPS is sensitive to lower tropospheric sulfur dioxide. So it's sensitive to also to high levels of sulfur dioxide. Um, but of, of all the JPSS instruments, uh, OMPS does have the greatest sensitivity to sulfur dioxide, uh, but it is a coarse spatial resolution. Uh, let's just see how all these, these three pieces of information come together. So here's the, the Veer's false color image again. There's the CRIS BTD for SO2, and then here's the OMPS SO2 loading. And so, you know, how these three pieces complement each other. So VIRS gives you the high spatial resolution and the very, very uh, large uh, wide swath. Um, it's sensitive to low and high altitude SO2 clouds if the SO2 is present in sufficient concentrations uh, relative to how complicated the background is. Okay, uh, by the background, I mean everything other than the SO2. Are there a lot of different cloud layers, things like that? Chris has good sensitivity to SO2 that's in the middle troposphere or higher, and it has very little sensitivity to SO2 that's near the ground. OMPS has the greatest sensitivity to SO2 of all the JPSS instruments, including sensitivity to SO2 that's in the lower troposphere, but it's a daytime only measurement, and it's at, at the course of resolution compared to Chris and Veers. So with that information in mind, we'll move on to the last exercise. And this is a flight planning exercise. So we're going to be in Italy, uh, more specifically Sicily, where Mount Etna is. Uh, Mount Etna is a very active volcano. Uh, in fact, it's so active, when you go on Google Earth, they couldn't find an image to take that didn't have a volcanic plume in it. This is actually from Google Earth. Um, so the thing about Mount Etna is it's near a populated region, and the Catania Airport um, is just south of Etna. So Etna, um, even when it's not having highly explosive activity, is a problem. Uh, it often causes problems at Catania Airport. So in this scenario, imagine you're a private pilot, and you're planning to fly from Naples south to Catania Airport. Um, and so before you leave, you're doing, you're doing your uh, pre-flight routine, and you, know, you notice there's a bulletin from the uh, Italian Geophysical Institute, INGV, which is a real thing, uh, that a persistent SO2 plume or cloud is emanating from Etna. And so for health and safety reasons, uh, the pilot wants, to, they have to avoid flying through Etna's SO2 cloud. Um, SO2, um, you don't want to breathe it in. Um, it's, it, it, it will uh, cause respiratory problems, especially in high concentrations. Um, also, the other thing about SO2 is it, it readily, it's readily reactive and converts to a sulfate. And so um, sulfates, when it, uh, airframes are exposed to sulfates, they'll corrode and degrade. Um, I don't know if anybody, well, some people will remember this, but in the 80s there was that uh, Hawaiian Airlines jet that fell apart in the air. And after years of study, they, they figured out it might have been exposure over the years to sulfur dioxide corroded and weakened the frame. Um, and so uh, for health and safety reasons, you don't want to fly through this as a pilot. So she wants to know if the Etna plume is close enough to the ground and can be flown over. So utilize the Veer's false color image, Chris SO2 brightness temperature difference, and OMPS SO2 column loading images on the next three slides to determine if the plume is likely located near the ground level. Okay, so I'll leave this up for a second. This is the Veer's false color image. I have Etna and Catania Airport labeled on there for convenience. So uh, digest that for a second. We Here, also have a slide out question open for this one. Here is the uh, Chris BTD. 
digest that for a moment, and I'll just flip between these two a couple of times. Okay, and finally, here is the OMPS SO2 loading. So, given this information, can the pilot safely fly over this cloud because it's low to the ground? Guess, yep. Is he trying to get into that airport at Catania? So right. So, no, no, he's, he's going to Catania. But let's assume that there's enough room for descent after you get past the plume. Yeah. Couple answers are coming in now. Is the plume? Oops, I realized there's an issue with that question. So remembering what I said about the varying sensitivities of the uh, the different instruments. All right. Um, well. The class is currently split 50-50. Oh, oh, no, it just changed. All right. Uh, we are now at 71% believe the plume is likely located near ground level. That would be the correct answer. So the reason for that is the Chris SO2 signature, um, there's, there's very little robust signature to go on there. Um, and as you recall that the Chris measurements are, are not have limited to no sensitivity to lower tropospheric SO2. Um, whereas OMPS is sensitive to SO2 at all levels, and the, and the signature is quite strong here. So when you see a strong difference in the signal uh, uh, related to SO2 between CRIS and OMPS, that's a dead giveaway in most cases that it's a, a something that's in the lower troposphere. So you could see how all these measurements complement each other, but then go back to the VIRS image, and um, you can see the SO2 in green here. The, the, the VIRS, uh, the quantitative value of it for SO2 is kind of limited, but the spatial information you get out of it is really important because you get to see the true extent of the cloud. Whereas as you go to these other sensors, they're more sensitive to SO2, but the footprints are larger. So this OMPS, well, OK, yeah, there's an SO2 cloud there, but you really have to go to the VIRS image to understand where the SO2 is. So there's a lot of reason to, to use all three of these sensors synergistically. Just yep. So, so would you speculate that, that maybe the volcano has kind of stopped erupting and now the SO2 is still in the atmosphere? Or can you, can you read anything out of out of what you just said? Um, just from a single JPSS overpass, no. You, you really need to measure the thing in time to, to know if it, you know, the, the emissions are continuing or have ceased. Um, that's where you would combine the satellite. In, in the case of Etna, it's a well-monitored volcano, um, well-monitored from the ground by the Geophysical Institute. So you combine information that they're releasing with the satellite to sort of understand the complete picture. but. Um, from, from just this alone, you can't tell if it, it's a detached SO2 cloud that's just sort of advecting with the wind right now or if it's, it's still uh, connected to the volcano and emissions are ongoing. But in this scenario, I just sort of said that, you know, the Geophysical Institute said that a persistent plume is emanating from Etna, so we already set it up with that information in mind. Okay, so to wrap up. Uh, I just want to give you a sense, I mean, I, what I did here, I think, with these previous two points is we tried to cover the basics. Why is this important? And, and what are the fundamentals of using these measurements to uh, at least qualitatively uh, detect and characterize uh, volcanic clouds? So now I want to give you a sense for what we're doing to go beyond that and, and add value. So there's something called the Volcanic Cloud Analysis Toolkit, or VOLCAT. It's a multifaceted system where it utilizes JPSS measurements and measurements from other satellites like GOES-R, um, tries to bring them all together in a way and extract maximum value. So one of the things it does is we can actually use, and JPSS measurements, particular VIRS 
measurements are really good at doing this, is finding vo uh, volcanoes where uh, that have suddenly started having, uh, where lava is suddenly present or, or hot gases are coming out. So in other words, volcanoes that have suddenly uh, become awa uh, awoken um, through uh, thermal anomaly detection. So this is the same way fires are detected in, in, in fears. And so we do this and then we issue alerts when a new volcano shows this sign of activity. Um, and then we can also detect automatically using sophisticated algorithms and multiple sensors including all the JPSS sensors, uh, when an eruption has actually occurred and send those alerts to volcanic ash advisory centers. I mean, we, we've all seen that the imagery is, is beautiful, it's striking, and you can, as a, a skilled human, can glean so much information from it. But the problem is the data volumes are huge. You can't look at every image everywhere all the time. And so having automated methods to supplement the human interrogation of imagery going forward, especially with these new satellite systems with very large data volumes, is critical. And so having something, hey, we detected something we think is a volcanic eruption, go look at that image and take the appropriate action. Um, actually, with, with VIRS yesterday, we detected an eruption in, in Papua New Guinea at a volcano that had no historical activity ever. And that, that VIRS alert was the first indication that that volcano had come, come to life. That's a very critical piece of information because when a volcano comes to life after no recorded activity, it often leads to something very, very big down the road. And so knowing that volcano has now, now come to life is, is a critical piece. But we wouldn't have known it without the alerts. It was in the imagery, but the odds of someone seeing it were very, very small. And the Volcanic Ash Advisory, Advisory Center did not see it until they got our alert. Um, also automated tracking of volcanic clouds in time uh, and um, characterization. So we can actually retrieve things like the height of the cloud, how much ash is in there, how much sulfur dioxide is in there, and then feed all of that information automatically into models to constrain those solutions of to where, where you know, they're, they're predicting where the cloud is going to be in the future. That's critical for planning. Um, if you're interested in, in volcanic cloud imagery, including imagery from VIRS, um, you can go to our website here. We have over 125 routine image sectors that cover about 90% of the 1,500 or so volcanoes in the world. Um, here's some other resources. Uh, there's, there's always a lot of cool images on the SIMS satellite blog and the CIRA Image Loop of Today website. Uh, the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers, there's the link to all nine of them. If you want to know more about that British Airways encounter, there's a documentary film on it uh, with, with interviews with Captain Moody and the crew and passengers. It's really, really, if you have about 40 minutes of time, uh, check it out. It's, it, it will keep your attention, I assure you. Um, USGS is a great source for, for things on this matter. Uh, NASA has an OMPSSO2 uh, product uh, website as well. Uh, and then general references, if you just want to get more into this topic, um, here are some general references. So with that, I've, I've got about eight minutes or so left, so we can have additional questions if they, we have them. Thank you very much, Michael. I have a pesky question for you. If you wouldn't mind, could you go back to slide 21? And that was from the Kamchatka event from 2014. And I am not a VAC meteorologist, um, and what you've said today is very instructive for me. But I look at this image, and there's a lot going on. And if you hadn't already outlined in a nice polygon yeah. and pointed to things, I'm not sure I could have, even after taking your class today, right. been able to pinpoint that um, subtle signature. Do you find that sometimes, or which volcanic events get missed? And, and why? And would this be one of them? Yeah, I mean, things get missed for, there's two primary reasons things get missed. The activity occurs at a volcano that nobody's looking at because it hasn't done anything in, in, in a long, long time or, or perhaps ever in recorded history. Um, like that volcano in Indonesia is an example of that. The other one is when the scene is very complex, like this one. Um, so, uh, and, 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 Admittedly, the, the image looks better on a computer screen than it does on, on, on that screen. But this is one where our, our alerting system did pick it up and the VAC did not. 
because uh, it was complex. Um, it, it is, it, like anything in, in, in forecasting or working an operational desk, it, it does take a lot of training um, as, you know, this is just an introduction. It, it requires a lot of training and a lot of um, mentoring and, and practice to, to really get good at these things. Um, if you've been looking at these things for many years like I have, it's, it's re it becomes really easy. Um, but when you're first introduced to it, it is a challenge. Um, and so with Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers, it is one of the biggest challenges we have in training. Um, because there aren't that many people in the world that are really experts at this. And there are, while there are some Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers that get action every day, there are some that do not. And so keeping forecasters uh, fresh and, and, and sharp with regards to this topic is a difficult challenge. And it's being undertaken in, in some international forums to try to figure out how we improve that. But um, yeah, that's a good question. Hi, Mike. Um, what is the latency of your alerts? Depends on the sensor and the source of the data. Um, so if we keep this relevant to JPSS, we do use direct broadcast data. So when we have that, the latency is low, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending. Um, uh, with uh, it, using global data, it's three hours right now, but that's about to go down because of McMurdo coming online. Um, and so it'll depend on where the, the granule is um, relative to, to uh, Svalbard and McMurdo. But uh, for geostationary, it's really low. Like for Gozar, we have an antenna where, I'm, where I, my office is in, in Wisconsin, and our latency is like five minutes on that. And the follow-up question is, what is the latency requirement? <laughs> well, the, the aviation industry has asked for five minutes because it only takes five minutes for an explosive eruption, the cloud to reach jet cruising altitudes. That being said, um, we've never been able to achieve that because we haven't had the measurements with enough uh, frequency to achieve that and, and latency. That we're getting closer now, that, though, with the Himawari 8s and the GOES, GOES Rs of the world. Um, you know, GOES R can do 30 second or one minute imagery, but it, frankly, it's never, it's, unless something happened, unless, let, unless um, Mount St. Helens or some other volcano in the Cascades comes awake, I'm afraid we're never going to see one minute go 16 imagery because the, it's so far down on the priority list. Um, so we, we, we're kind of stuck with 15 minute imagery right now. But, um, but with Himawari 8, we do get two and a half minute images over Kamchatka routinely, and we see the value of that. It's huge, yeah. There is an SO2 flag in the new CAPS products, so have you ever used it? Uh, I mean, it might be using the same brightness temperature difference that you I, might what, be Yeah, I think it's a residual from the retrieval. Um, so I, I do think that an email gets sent off to the VAC when that flag trips. Um, but, you know, you really need to present the imp information in an integrated way. That flag alone, what it causes... <laughs> I've, been in a, I've spent a lot of time in VACs, and, you know, that flag goes off, and it's like, okay, I don't know what this is. I don't understand it. Um, you know, it, you, you have to take that information and integrate it with imagery where they can actually see something. Seeing is believing. Um, and that's what we're trying to do is take that s step. But the flag alone, it, it, it evol to trust that, even though it's good, it's, it's just you have a hard time convincing people to take action on that. When there are big consequences to issuing volcanic ash advisory set when nothing is going on, huge consequences. Uh, Mike, we have a question off a of slide out here. Um, for the Popocatapetl volcano case, can you describe the actions taken by the forecasters in the Washington VAC and uh, how long it took it took to execute those actions. Um, how much work do they need to do to verify volcanic eruption before they communicate something? Yeah, okay, so it, it, it depends on the volcano, but in Popo's case, um, there is a webcam as well. So if it's daytime, they will, we will consult that webcam. Now it's often sucked in with clouds um, and you can't, you can't see anything. Um, 
But if, if something shows up in satellite imagery and it's unambiguous, whether or not they corroborate it with a webcam look or, or the meteorological watch office or the geophysical institute, they'll issue an ash advisory. Um, so for instance, if they, would, you know, if they have this VIRS image and they see this, that's unambiguous. Um, they would issue on that alone. So it, the, you know, the, the time is, okay, I see it in the image, it's unambiguous. You have to draw a polygon around it. But then uh, there's also uh, a requirement to forecast where that cloud is going to be 6, 12, and 18 hours in the future. So sometimes what VAX will do is when they, when they initially detect an event, they will uh, send out an advisory that does not include the forecast. It only includes where the cloud is right now. And they'll say in the message, in the remarks, um, uh, volcanic eruption detected at such and such time. Uh, uh, additional information forthcoming. Then they'll take the time to have the dispersion model run and then, then create the forecast panels. But the, the goal is to get the initial advisory out, even if it doesn't have the forecast, within, you know, five minutes or so of, of the information, uh, relevant information coming in. Yeah. Any more? Thank you. That was great, Mike. Very interesting. Okay, now we're gonna uh, we're gonna go to a break. There's uh, some new freshments for you, and then um, if we do, we have any slides? We, we have one question left for Nadia and Dan. Maybe we just want to want to take that now. Okay. Um, Nadia or Dan, you can come up to the microphone and answer this one. Uh, Nadia mentioned that she was displaying new caps using slices, vertical axes versus uh, some location. Uh, two questions. Are these slices currently done in new cap space along track, cross track? And what do forecasters need versus latitude, longitude, or a storm cross section of some sort? Um, this is, this is uh, an AWIP sp um, specific feature, and I think I may have mistaken in saying that in AWIPS you have to display that vertical cross-section along a scan line. If I'm, I, I don't know AWIPS, but you, I think you, you, can, you, you, can, you can choose your line. Yeah, you, you can choose it to be wherever, so it does not have to be. You can choose it to be wherever, so it was my mistake, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you, 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 when there's a, f a storm feature, you can draw your own line for a cross-section. You don't have to s honor the scan lines. Way, the way AWIPS works is, is it sees that data as like a, a volume, 3D volume, and then AWIPS allows you to draw a cross-section through that volume however you want. And, and so that's how you can create the, um, you know, the, the, the slice uh, horizontally or, or if you're looking at a, a cross-section. But then same thing for um, you know, the slice that's this way, you just specify what level, whether it be a pressure level or a height level, uh, th that you'd want to see. So it's basically just how you want to display that. I think, I think Jordan created the very first AWIPS uh, slice of new caps data ever. The claim to fame. Uh, yes, that's true. And I'm going to unsolicitedly barge him to say that when making those cross sections on AWIPS in Alaska, we have found that if, if your A point and your A prime point cross the date line or 180 degrees longitude, you, you will confuse AWIPS. And so on, this is another one of those only in Alaska only, kind of gotcha. Or Pacific. But, and we've, it's been reported up the, to Raytheon or whoever, so they'll fix it. But. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll return back at um, 4 o'clock and uh, continue on with Jarrell on training resources that will be available.